Thank you for watching Concord United on YouTube. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest videos. If you'd like more information about our church, please visit concordunited.org. We hope you will take advantage of our many opportunities to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. Many centuries later, someone would write words that summed up exactly how he felt. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Had he been alive to hear those words, he undoubtedly would have stood to his feet and applauded loudly at the truth of them. For he did wear a crown, and he was most definitely uneasy. I suppose we could say that he was a product of his times because the times were uneasy. His subjects were restless and quick to turn sour on his government. It was as if they sensed that a drastic change was coming and they were looking for the one who would lead them through it. Whoever that was, he knew they weren't looking at him. He wasn't wise like Solomon, but he knew his people had no love for him like they did for King David. He was probably the least likely to be in the position he was in. He was the youngest son of one of his father's marriages and was part of a family that was one hot mess of a dumpster fire. His father was king before him. And while his father wasn't the smartest man that ever held power, his father knew what he needed to know. His father knew how to keep the right people happy. And the right people were in Rome. When the Romans took over this part of the world, they needed a man who could keep the peace and who could control the population. And his father could do that because his father fully embraced the idea that it is more secure to be feared than loved. His father became king, not through some ancient ritual that involved oil and sacrifice and whatnot. He had been appointed by a Roman senate. And his father did what the Romans wanted. He kept the peace, often through brutal methods. The problem was that his father loved the power. He loved it to the point that it drove him insane. His father began to see threats everywhere and in every one, and even killed two of his own sons because he was convinced that they were trying to overthrow his rule. Then there was the time that the foreigners came to visit. They weren't official diplomats. They were more like emissaries from another country. And they came to his father's court with some story about following a star to honor a new king of the Jews that had been born. And this was a threat that could not be abided. His father would have killed them had he been able to find them. But failing to do that, he simply killed all the babies in Bethlehem. The name of Herod became one that was feared, not loved. That was the family that the new king had been born into. And with the position came the name. He was called Herod as well. And he took over a kingdom that was restless, primed for rebellion, and thus worrisome for Rome. Individuals kept popping up who were attracting followers. And this had all started about three years ago with that fanatic who was baptizing people in the River Jordan. He actually kind of liked that guy. He found him interesting and Amusing, even though he spouted off a lot of crazy ideas. But then the fanatical baptizer publicly insulted him and his wife, and she could be difficult to manage. She put him in a position in which he had no choice but to execute the man, although he hated to do it. But then again, what is one man's life worth when it threatens a kingdom? Now there was a new threat, a wandering rabbi who was even more troublesome. The rabbi was attracting a lot of followers and a lot of attention. And the problem was he didn't break any laws and he didn't speak aggressively against the government. He didn't do anything that was wrong or that he could be arrested for. 
There was no reason to arrest him and risk enraging his followers. And those reports of him healing people and casting out demons, those are the kind of stories that become legend. And legends can be a threat to a kingdom. He needed to be rid of this troublemaker. But how could he do it without inciting a revolt and thus bringing Rome into the picture? As someone would write centuries later, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And this rabbi had enemies other than a puppet king. There was another group that Herod had to tolerate, although he found them to be religiously fanatical as well. A group called Pharisees that did everything they could to hold to the ancient Jewish law. This rabbi challenged them repeatedly about the meaning and interpretation of that law. And they would like to be rid of him as well. Perhaps the king could persuade them to take care of this problem and keep his own hands from getting dirty at the same time. He would simply drop the hint to a couple of well-meaning Pharisees that this Jesus was no longer safe in Herod's territory. And by no longer safe, he made it clear that he meant no longer living. Surely the man was smart enough to understand the threat that he was under and would simply go away and let things run the way they were supposed to. Now, I have no idea if those are the thoughts and feelings of of Herod, Antipas, but I thought it might be helpful to sort of use my imagination to help set the context of today's scripture passage. As we continue our Lenten series, Facing Jerusalem, today we look at how Jesus reacted when confronted with very serious threats to the work that he was doing and very serious threats to his life. Our scripture comes from Luke's gospel, from the 13th chapter. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. And there are a couple of things in this passage that probably need a little bit of explanation. First, when Jesus refers to Herod as a fox, he doesn't necessarily mean someone who is crafty or sly. The phrase, sly as a fox, is relatively modern. And we've just adopted it into our language. In Jesus' day, to call someone a fox was a way of saying, you are insignificant. Or it may also mean, you are an evil predator and no one really likes you. Secondly, the phrase today, tomorrow, and the next day shouldn't necessarily be taken literally. That was a phrase that was an idiomatic expression of a short amount of time. We do the same thing when we tell someone, we'll be with you in a little while. A little while could be 20 minutes. A little while could be seven or eight hours. It simply means a short time from now. And what Jesus is saying is, I won't be here for long before my destiny is fulfilled. But let's not let the semantics of this get in the way of the message. Jesus' response to the Pharisees' warning is clearly meant to be a rebuke of Herod, and it borders on being an outright insult. It is a rebuke and a challenge. Jesus is saying to Herod, I can't be bothered with you. I have work that I'm doing, and you are absolutely powerless to stop it. If you want to come and challenge me, that's fine, but I won't be turned aside by you. You don't control me, nor do you particularly bother me. This is God's doing. You can't stop it. But Jesus' response had consequences that run deeper than we might at first imagine. To say such things to an important government official was perhaps one of the most dangerous things a person could do in Jesus' time. Those were the words of defiance and rebellion. Those were words that could be interpreted as treason. Not only was Jesus saying that Herod was insignificant, but by implication, Jesus could be interpreted as saying that since Herod was Rome's man, Even Rome couldn't stop Jesus' work. Such words usually meant immediate death. 
But it wasn't just Jesus who was in danger. Notice that the scripture passage starts with an odd phrase, at that very hour. Well, that leads us to ask, what was going on that the Pharisees interrupted? If we zoom out a little bit and read the verses and chapters right before today's passage, we see that Jesus is teaching. He is telling parables. He is clearly not alone. So if Jesus is responding to Herod in a way that could be construed as insulting or treasonous, couldn't the ones around him be implicated as well? If they were following him, they must believe the same things he does. So were they a part of a rebellion? Guilt by association was and still is a very real thing. What about the Pharisees? Would they really go back to Herod and deliver Jesus' message? That was dangerous too. Herod's obvious questions would be, well, did you make him understand? Did you argue with him? Did you stand up for me? Did you call the authorities to arrest him on the spot? If not, does that mean you may agree with him and thought what he said was okay? Suddenly, it's not just Jesus that is under threat. It's everyone who was around him and who had been in contact with him. But Jesus' disciples particularly shouldn't have been surprised. Jesus warned them and us that following him and being his disciple can be an uncomfortable and even dangerous business. The life of Christ is not easy, and Jesus never promised that it would be. In fact, he promised just the opposite. It's a rewarding life, but persecution and suffering are part of it. He emphatically told his disciples that they would be hated by the world because of their commitment to him. They would suffer. They would be mocked, beaten, exiled, persecuted in any number of ways to stop them from following Jesus and spreading the message. Jesus was under a threat, and those with him were under threat. And I think that we have a hard time fully understanding that in our culture. We've had about 250 years of religious freedom. We don't know what it means to be persecuted for our faith, and we should all deeply thank God for that. I fear that we take it for granted. For us, being disciples of Christ is not that hard although there are times when we may feel persecuted. People may make fun of us and think we are fools for believing what we do. We may be called into the HR office because someone complained about us showing our Christianity. We may suffer a loss of friendships or social status because of our beliefs. These things happen. These things are not real persecution. In our culture, most of the things that we label as persecution are really just annoyances and inconveniences. With very few exceptions, no one is harmed or killed because of their faith. And we are certainly not under any government persecution. I'm planning a trip to England later on this spring, so I've been reading a lot of British history, and I am astounded at the number of heads that were lopped off and the number of people burned at the stake simply because they believed something or professed a belief in something other than the people in power did. That's why this particular passage of Luke's gospel may not resonate with us as much as it does with those who are truly suffering for their faith. We just don't think about it because we don't have to worry about it. None of us left our homes this morning concerned that someone was watching us. None of us have the thought that there could be someone in the parking lot writing down our license plate numbers to report us to authorities for worshiping in public. Pastor Brooke told me about a young man from China who attended seminary with her and who told her that he still found himself looking over his shoulder as he walked through campus, trying to find the people who were surveilling him. In many parts of our world, it is dangerous to be a follower of Christ. Everything can be taken away. Jobs, freedom, family, and even life. 
And yet, ironically, it is in just such places of persecution where the church is strongest and where it is growing the fastest. Perhaps it's because they take inspiration from how Jesus faced threats. Jesus surely recognized the risks that were in play and the threats that surrounded him. But fear of physical pain and death would not deter him from the purpose to which he had dedicated himself. And I'm certain that all of us would like to think we would have that kind of courage were we in a similar situation. But I doubt that we will. It's hard to fully imagine how, would, how we would react if a situation did occur where we had to make a choice between staying committed to Christ or suffering persecution. And that's what makes this scripture so hard to apply to us. We know how everything turned out. It turned out well for Jesus because there was a glorious resurrection. But when we dismiss this or think it doesn't apply, I think we make a mistake. There's no part of the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, that's insignificant or that has no meaning for us. If a passage seems to have no direct application to us in the 21st century America, it means we may have to wrestle with it a little bit longer, kind of look at it from a different angle, perhaps put ourselves inside the story. Who would we be in this passage? Now, I don't mind telling you, I wrestled with this passage for reasons that I mentioned earlier, the fear of persecution from authorities who want to get rid of me, well, that's not very realistic. I don't think anyone is out to get me for what I believe. And although I could give in to pride and think that I'm Jesus in this story, my honesty quickly tells me that I am not. So who am I in this story? Who are we? The answer I came up with is very troubling but it's an answer that reminds us of the importance of this Lenten season. Because there are other characters in the story that we might overlook, Herod and the Pharisees. Herod was not threatened by Jesus in any physical way and probably not in a serious political way. Jesus was far more concerned with showing God's character than replacing governments. But Herod could not tolerate any threat to his power and rule. Whatever miraculous and wonderful work Jesus might be doing in the world didn't matter if Herod couldn't be the God of his own life. And I think we often fall into that same line of thinking. We want to follow Jesus, but we want to follow as long as Jesus is going where we wanted to go anyway. And when we hear those calls to deeper discipleship, to a deeper faith that might challenge what we believe, when we hear the call to fellowship and be in mission to those that we don't like, well, it suddenly becomes very difficult for us to give up control of where the journey is taking us. We understand that Jesus asks us to take up a cross and follow him, but we still want to be the ones that determine how heavy or how, or how light that cross will be. The sad part is that deep down, we know how out of control our lives can get and how hard we work to keep up the appearances of control. I'm certain that Herod was ill at ease because he had the backstage view of himself. And we all wrestle with that backstage view. The view that only we have and that we try to hide from everyone else. Herod covered his with brutality and with threats. And we cover ours with any number of masks that we wear in public to keep people from seeing what we know about ourselves. I think of the moment when the great and terrible Oz is exposed as a scared little man, pulling levers, turning valves, creating fire and smoke just to keep up the facade of being the wonderful wizard who is in complete control of everything. And I haven't forgotten the Pharisees. They were people who wanted to get their faith right. So afraid of making a mistake in belief and practice that they lost sight of the God who was the object of their faith. Theirs was a constant battle to make sure that Correct procedures were followed. Doctrine was ironclad, and most importantly, that the right sort of people were allowed in. And I think we can be guilty of that as well. I'm sure the Pharisees were well-intentioned, as are we. But when we appoint ourselves as the arbiters of correct faith, we immediately become critics of those who, in our eyes, have the incorrect faith. We have a tendency to see ourselves as the gatekeepers 
of those who belong and who don't belong. Those who deserve our grace and love and those who don't. And don't get me wrong, doctrine is important. Tradition is important. But too often when those things become our most important focus, people and even Jesus begin to go out of focus. When we become so rigid in our ideas of how things should be, it becomes easy to denigrate and dismiss those who have other interpretations. We lose the ability to hear others and thus we lose the ability to love others. It's a dark path that moves from they are wrong to they are bad to they are a threat to they must be removed. They're not welcome. And when we are challenged by Jesus through the Holy Spirit to change how we think, change how we see others, many times we just wish Jesus would go somewhere else and leave us alone. We wish Jesus would just let things run the way they're supposed to. Now this may sound a little harsh. Believe me, I'm preaching to myself as much as to anyone else. This is why the church for years has had a season of Lent. Lent is all about looking at ourselves honestly, seeking out the places in our spiritual lives that could use some help to discover how we can live more in tune with God, how we can be more Christ-like, how we can clean up those areas that, that resemble Herod and Pharisees more than we would like to admit. But Lent is not about feeling guilty. It's about repentance. It's about admitting mistakes and allowing God's grace and the love of Christ to take control and fill those places with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, after Jesus gives his message to Herod and states that he must go to Jerusalem. He expresses lament over the failure of Jerusalem to recognize and receive God's love. And they are the words of a despairing parent whose children have, been, have completely ignored the protection and love of their parents. Jesus says, your house is left to you. You will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. On its face, Jesus' statement sounds sad and tragic. But there is also grace. The one who comes in the name of the Lord is Christ himself. There isn't total abandonment. Christ will come again. That is the hope of all who suffer persecution. Christ will come and will bring justice and will make things right. It's the message of hope and grace to all of us who were and are Herod and Pharisees. We may have made terrible mistakes and terrible misjudgments, but there will be another chance to recognize the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Christ himself. And Christ will not be stopped by any threats or any attempts to ignore him. Christ will be about his work which is to redeem all of creation and to offer grace and love in amounts that are just simply unimaginable. As we continue our spiritual journey through the terrible days of Jesus' passion and death to a glorious continuation of the story, let our souls be at peace. For those enduring their own cross and for those who are seeking earnestly to repent, Christ is coming. Amen.